crazy. <laughs> Only one word for it. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you, everyone, for taking out your time to uh, come here tonight. I am uh, so honored to introduce to you tonight uh, Teresa Rayford, who, as you know, is running for mayor. And, um, you know, she has been a prominent member of the activist community in Portland. She um, came back to Portland from Texas when her nephew tragically was the victim of gun violence. And that started her uh, role in the activism world, becoming a strong and prominent voice for the Black community. And then later having that expand out to greater Portland, representing the, um, the voices of many vulnerable and minority communities. So we're really honored to have her here. And we also have with us Mike Crenshaw, a veteran Portland rapper, activist, and mentor. He moved here to Portland uh, in the 90s and for the last 20 years has been a cornerstone of the hip hop community, really bringing together the, um, the different aspects of hip hop and activism and social justice. And uh, we're so honored to have both of you here tonight. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. So I'm in here, Mike. Uh -huh. No, I was saying I'm honored and thankful that you're here tonight. Thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule and family time and everything um, during a crisis to be here with us. Thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to see what you're doing running for mayor, you know, <laughs> anything I can do to contribute. Yes. Awareness of your campaign, you know, and hopefully we get somebody in there that's real, right? Absolutely. It's time. It's past time. We got the evidence now. So it's time to get the return for our communities. And because of like what Anna was saying about the solidarity we've built over the last 10 years, uh, when we were demanding uh, responses to children being murdered in our community that we would hear the politicians talking about the crime and talking about the violence, but they never would solve those crimes. You know, I'm like, if you got over 200 unsolved homicides, you know, let's get some investigations going. And that's kind of where my work started. And now to be able to be in a position where I'm one of, you know, four prominent candidates that can be the next police commissioner here in the city of Portland. The children being a big deal. Hey, Andrew. Hey, Andrew. Yeah, no, that's what's up. And then um, Anna had mentioned that um, it's, it's the brother who got murdered on um, a jog. Yeah. Moon, right? Um, that is his birthday today, you know, and this is a national problem. It's a historical problem. It's a current problem. And it's also a local problem. And, I know that you've been in the streets with Don't Shoot PDX and Black Lives Matter for years, um, connecting the dots between gun violence and, and trauma and police brutality. Um, it's just a heavy time. I feel like uh, every time I turn on the news or, or look at my phone, another there's another video of one of us getting murdered. And I'm curious, Teresa, what are your what's your action plan? Like, how do you, how do you plan to turn around a culture that's so ingrained? You know, you're going to ask the black women, how are we going to end racism? <laughs> but uh, I, mean, I mean, you know, I mean, but that's the, that's literally the truth of what we have to do because what we're learning and what my work has demanded as an activist, as somebody that's organizing community, um, to understand and to use political strategies to make change possible. We're seeing that these policies and the way that our constitution is constructed is built up on our backs as labor, um, but is also intended to keep authority over us. So when we in our communities uh, feel like we're over-policed and we're telling people we're over-policed, when I go out and protest or I demand an audit or we testify at the state capitol, uh, we're able to see exactly what that language looks like and why is it appropriated and applied to us. So when we have this intense feeling of being policed or being targeted, um, not only by racist violence, but also by systemic violence, the devaluation of who we are and what we can contribute to society, 
Um, all of that is inherently a social behavior that's built on white supremacy. And you, you rap about it all the time, but this past summer, we had brothers and we had senators and we had lobbyists and Congress people and all of these people from around the nation basically stating that reparations had to be made to our people because we were stolen people brought to stolen land and never to be put in a capacity to be equal, um, never to be put in a capacity to where we could value our lives and join society as equal participants. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just by applied language. So to dismantle that language takes strong authority that actually understands that construct. And the fact that leaders that we have now are so intentional about saying that they're gonna take like equity training or something like that's like me trying to learn how to not be allergic to something that will kill me right and that i've inherently learned through my my response to it that my body is fearful of it we are inherently uh in society where we are learned and taught to fear you me my son my grandchildren you know what i'm saying and we have to dismantle that but until we have a affirmation um, in our communities, in our leadership, determined, uh, responsive people is not gonna change. My platform, if you could check it out, um, right. the people's platform, I built it intentionally um, mm -hmm. because I wanna be accountable, because I wanna build ethical value in political involvement. Mm -hmm. I want people to understand that we can change anything we want, but we have to manage to educate ourselves and our community at large in a way that's not intimidating. And I use art, you know, I'm like you, I'm constructive with it. I'll audit uh, something that somebody says, and then I'll connect with you or Glenn. And, you know, like we did that time I got arrested <laughs> um, during the, you know, the anniversary of Mike Brown, you know, that was a very politically um, set up situation. There shouldn't have been any kind of violence coming to me or anybody else from what we did for the two days prior to that circumstance. So, I mean, you know, you could speak because we are in proximity doing the same type of work, but until we are the people um, serving us, that work is not gonna be taken as a value for life. And we know that it's on the record. You got brothers dying and it takes 74 days and a video to show up. Come on. Mm -hmm. And you know, to be honest with you, we've been also conditioned to, to expect failure of the so-called justice system, you know? So I would be lying if I said that I wouldn't be surprised mm. if when there's no justice brought for that that young man's life being taken by those people. You can take we're in a we're in a state where you can take mm -hmm. the life of somebody on camera. Mm -hmm. And as long as you're law enforcement, you get away with murder. Yeah. And if these people were me, deputized. Hey, if you or me had to defend ourselves because they always say, well, we, we feared for our lives. We was so it was self-defense just because you were scared. You have an unarmed person. Somebody looks like you or me. And then you got often more than one person that's armed, but they're scared for their lives. So by the same token, shouldn't we be scared for our lives every time we see them? Yeah. And shouldn't that same right to protect ourselves to self-defense be extended to us. So yeah. to, to you and me, Teresa, this is common sense. <laughs> exactly. I, I get like, I come from a radical background and we're like rev revolution over reform. Yeah. However, we need to understand there's got to be a diversity of tactics, right? So yeah. if, you, if you have the wherewithal and the commitment to get in there and move things from that level, then we can support that. And this is the thing that the things that are being moved forward throughout the state are being moved forward because we demanded those movements. The state legislator looking, you know, at these, uh, the recording grand jury bills, uh, the body cams, uh, measure 11, our, our mass incarceration, getting those numbers, looking at the data from the gang task force, holding them accountable to stop data. Um, all of that took a lot of commitment to research because I'm not a, a paid city employee. You know what I'm saying? But I'm educating 
generations of our children on what political activism means. It doesn't just have a containment of showing up with your signs, protesting, getting the bullhorn eloquently saying how you feel about the things that you despise because they harm you. It's about researching these systems and understanding what it will take to bring political measure to unraveling them because there's not a tool that exists. I, I'm a historian, I hang out with archivists and I, I study policy and I study why certain language was applied in a certain way to make a certain outcome happen. That's just the basic policy. Like you're bringing something forth and you're paying for it so that something happens because of it. In our city and in our state, policy that pertains to our bodies, connected to our bodies, marginalized at risk disadvantage. And it's all for quantifying those oppressions. There is no money for accountability. There's no funding for investment. So if I'm a voter in the city of Portland and you're a public safety issue and we got money for public safety issues, I'm gonna deal with my public safety issues. I'm going to incarcerate. I'm not gonna spend money on education. And we lost those opportunities through the state legislator. The, the, bill, the thing about a mayor is not only are you a city leader that brings forth the culture of courage for people and you help them expand their opportunities uh, to connect themselves to resources through the city, you stand up for them to make sure that they're looked out for, but you also have a voice to the state legislator. You also have influence over the governor, which Ted showed through the COVID crisis, but which we haven't seen leaders in this city show over all the crises that we've been dealing with. When we were saying, hey, stop the rent, you know, it's getting too high, we're gentrifying our neighborhood. They were like, oh yes, yeah, unfortunate. I look on the record, it's not too unfortunate when people are making money off of it. You know what I'm saying? It's unfortunate because we're moving those children onto the streets and then we're saying that we have an unhoused, you know, unhoused community that's just like out of control. But we know that through data again, through I was about to say gang banging against the system, but, but, uh, but by demanding accountability uh, from the system, we're looking at that data. These are children coming out of foster care. These are people being reunified to their communities out of mass incarceration. And the majority of them are juveniles or children with disabilities. Um, that's a problem because that means that we don't have a safety net set up when we know that once you age out of foster care, you're gonna need housing and opportunities. We know that if you come back into the community through being a juvenile that was locked up and you can't literally go stay back with your family, that you have to have a plan for reentry. And that plan is not gonna be how innovative you are at making sure you check all the boxes on the lease that your parole officer or probation officer gets you. So we have to make plans for the way that we're living in society right now. Like why are people unhoused? Why do we have mass incarceration? Why do we leave the state in taking children away from their families without putting resources into those communities? Why are we uh, moving entire communities and saying that we have a sanctuary city when we're not building housing for immigrant families? I know a lot of immigrant families with huge families. We are displacing communities because people don't have places to put huge families. You don't even have a place to age if you have children and you need to go back to them. You're gonna be somewhere else. We have to start planning for everybody. We can't just plan for the global city on top of the backs of the people that are here. You know, and we need people that'll look out for us and bring us into that planning. And that's what I wanna do. I don't wanna make any decisions for anybody. I want you to be informed. I want you to be engaged. I want it to be usual and customary for us to talk to the mayor and go to city hall. I don't want it to be a protest. I'm tired of that and I know better. Okay. I can dig it. I'm um, a rapper. Huh? Yeah, I'm a rapper. You're a rapper. <laughs> Man. Um, now, I'm going to maybe reinforce some of what you're saying with a little bit of art. Um, maybe I'll play some songs perform and uh we can reflect on the words and and then come back and talk a little bit more yes okay that's what's up this first joint is called thank you for everything um it goes out to the ancestors that lived so that we could live and breathe ourselves <laughs> Anna needs to bring her respect <laughs> Freeware was something I don't care. I see, I don't stare. We've been right here for years. Thank you for everything. I 
Something I don't care. I see, I don't stare. We've been right here for years. Thank you for everything. I say this every day. I wake up and I pray. These are the words I say. but it's hard to hear. I'm sorry, what was that? I'm so sorry to cut you in the middle of your song. Uh, we, and we would love to be able to hear the lyrics, but it's hard for us to hear the lyrics. Uh, it's hard for us to hear what you're saying. I know sometimes these um technological. Uh, Definitely, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna just uh, forego that for now because I don't wanna slow up the, the real talk that we could be having. Okay. Wait, is it possible? Uh, and it's hard to hear you right now, too. It's hard to hear me right now, too, huh? Yeah. Shoot. Um, all right. Well, let me see what I can do here. And does it have anything to do, possibly, with the actual connection, uh, the physical wire going into your computer? It could. So why don't I why don't I undo this microphone and just go off of my onboard mic and see if that happens then? Okay. Okay. So can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. And everything is clear? Uh, it's it's still a little low. We'd love to hear you louder. Love to hear me louder. Let's see. Um, is that better? That's much better, yes. Better, okay. Okay, so do we, uh, we can just pick up where we were, you know, I, there, there were some lyrics in the song that I wrote it, you know, Arietta Ward is singing on the hook. She goes, how much longer will we take it? There's a better world out there. We will make it. Yeah. Tighter waves and the levee's breaking. Water's rising, wash it all away. And what I'm talking about is the, the dynamic and the phenomenon of for, for centuries, uh, our lives being expendable um, at the hands of police, at the hands of the state, and at the hands of law enforcement. And so the question becomes a question of when we become desensitized to the frequency at which we get killed, 
it's really a question of how much longer do we take it? And there's, I talk about, you know, we're ex black people, um, we're expected to be very strong and resilient. Um, but after a while, that same strength and resilience becomes toxic because it, it drains us of our spirit and our ability to exhibit well-being. Um, so that's just what I was talking about in the song. Yeah, that, that sounds amazing. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, right, so you got you got any questions for me, like as, as an artist that supports your campaign? Well, I just wanted to ask you, how are you dealing with everything that's happening? Because I know that coming from Chicago mm -hmm. and just being on the front line of, uh, of wanting to educate our children about who they are mm -hmm. and how complex these systems are, like, I connect you with like ta Coates Coates and Zindi and you know, like I, I, I believe that if you wrote a book or you did a comic strip or something that was a, a visual of the work that you do with your voice, that mm. that frequency would be utilized for generations. And so right now in the present that we're in, mm -hmm. um, I'm always curious about the present. How do you feel right now? Cause I know, I know history, you've already made it. It's documented. People are gonna read about you. They're gonna read about this experience we're having, but mm -hmm. how are you doing and how are you taking care of yourself and, and just yeah. maintaining and being able to be there for us? It, you know, it's a trip. Uh, because at any given moment, if one was to ask me how I was doing, there's so many layers. Like on certain layers, there's just challenges, there's stress, there's anxiety, there's fear, there's uncertainty, there's grief, there's trauma. Um, but then on other levels, there's hope because this is the first time in my life that there's been an unprecedented universal opportunity for us to slow down, mm -hmm. to think about and reflect on what our priorities are and to look at the lives we've led up to this point in a very critical way. Um, that said, my political consciousness has prepared me for this moment. Mm -hmm. The ancestors have prepared me for this moment. So I was born with a purpose. We're supposed to be alive right now. Yes. You know, and this, this, this crisis, which is not really, it's not it's not an act of, of of a higher power it's a failure of a, a global economic system to take care of people mm -hmm. so we have we have the means to take care of the sick but we choose to uh prioritize the profit of privatization over giving universal access to the technology and the medicine and and the skills of the medical staff that could actually save lives, right? Yeah. That that's this is not new. But but the problem is is that we've not had the political power to hold a mandate that set a standard that invested in us. You know what I'm saying? We're always waiting for the right person or the right time or we praying it or we're getting involved or we're the first of our community to step, you know, like it's all that 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 bureaucracy that we believe is channeling our opportunities and maybe we can keep failing enough to where we finally win you know that's not it this is writ you know what i'm saying it's writ it's on the record that we are entitled to second class powers so until we facilitate the 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 process of of obtaining it because i was on a call yesterday with a lot of very uh, motivated powerful people in our construction community with the the national association of minority contractors so you got all the communities together of contractors professional service providers looking for opportunities they're asking me you know like hey what are we going to do and i'm like until we get our community on our side and it doesn't have to be like follow what i'm doing but we have to hold a priority that why we're these stakeholders and people are influenced by our being um, open up the floodgates for everybody. They don't have to come to me to get anything. I'm gonna open it up so that everybody has access because that should be usual and customary. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when I left town, I grew up in Portland. When I moved to Texas, it seemed like there was an abundance of opportunities because we were so fruitful in giving. And that was just planting seeds for everybody else to grow. So I'm watching and bewilderment, you know, working for a black CPA and I'm business development and I'm like, planting seeds in people's business, they got the investment of community engagement. 
helping them multiply their opportunities from their visions to the board, you know, and we doing the accounting and watching the growth, managing the growth, developing the growth, building the partnerships. And then I come home and everybody's like, no, nah, mine. And I'm like, no, nah, you ain't got nothing if you ain't open with it. Like you grow from plants, you know, we know this is how the earth is, but we have to bring that mindset in because the leaders that we have, I look at how things are managed. We are managed and dealt with. We are not invested in. And I say that because you have to seek that opportunity to say, where's my stake? Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about me if I'm a vegan. You know what I'm saying? Like, where's my stake? Where's my priority? You yeah. don't have people going to Congress saying that we're old reparations because on the record, we've delivered the evidence to show that your, uh, your vicious attacks on our community systemically and socially are a part of the system that is, uh, you know, you literally have approved of it. This is maintenance. We're yeah. a commodity. Right. We have to decommoditize ourselves. We talk about liberation, decolonization. We actually have to be intentional and do that. We well, have to take that process apart. I agree with you, uh, you know. But it takes education and we, ha we don't have that investment. This city here, we're leading the nation and children not uh, graduating from even high school. Some of the questions that I have right now um, in this moment are, what are we, what do we get to walk away from? What do we get to move towards? What, what, do, what can we afford to leave behind? It's a matter of life and death out here, you know? And when I think about the fact that I can get eight hours of work done from my computer at home in four hours without having to commute, when I think about the fact that when I look at the sky and the horizon, the air is visibly cleaner and the clouds are more crisp, right? There's an opportunity unfolding before us about what life could be. Now, we know that these fools are gonna be operating overtime to make sure that their assault on all of our rights as, as working people um, is intensified. So the question that I have is how do we pivot in this moment? And how do we take the benefit of having the opportunity to slow down, of having all, all the things laid bare? It's transparent now. We know that we're dealing with, with parasites. Exploiters. Exploiters, extractors. Yeah. We know this. I mean, this right now for rich people that exploit people, this is an investment opportunity. This stimulus, this crisis, this pandemic, this is a cushion for them to reestablish their businesses and their industries. But what we need to do is we need to be mindful that we are the industry. Mm -hmm. If in fact we all, you know, the 99% have been commoditized, that means that our essential labor, the labor that everybody is counting on right now, we have to have ownership over it. We need to support people unionizing their employment. You know what I'm saying? We need to look out for the care and maintenance and the health care. We need to standardize creating our own buildings and benefits um, in our community, like how you're able to sit at home and work. That's a business. You're a frontline essential worker. They can't just send out social workers to communities no more. They need people that can actually be assets and speak for communities. When this first started, um, I got in contact with a healthcare professional because I knew that there's government funding that's going to come into communities. And since I'm trying to fight oppression and you know all this exploitation i wanted to make sure that whatever is happening right now even though i can't go to city hall every week or anything else that i had somebody on the front line that understands the discussions about the economic values that are coming into communities as well as the health values behind those economic dollars because they're going to always say that this money is coming in because of the pandemic and the health crisis the money is coming in because they can exploit the pandemic and the and this yeah so what we're doing is we've already established a system where we're getting all of that information every wednesday we have people clocking in from all over the country that are sharing and providing resources and information to people in our community so that they can share that information with other people in the community. You even have elderly people sitting on the phone lines logged into the Zoom meetings so that they can get this information. But what's so awesome about it is ARIA even documents it and sends it out all through the week. So we're trying to make sure 
that we build and establish those channels because what I can tell you is that nobody's doing it for us. Everybody, as soon as they realize they can get money for it, they started figuring out how they can do it, but we beat them to it because in our communities, we already do mutual aid. In our communities, we already organize and strategize around showing up for each other. So since we had the start on that, we have to establish the standard on it. And we need to make sure that funds that come into our cities and that the leaders who have ex access to those funds, who are representing the need for those funds are speaking on our behalf. Mm -hmm. and not redistributing the funds to the same people that already exploit us. Um, mm -hmm. People already know one of the main things I want to go do in City Hall once I'm in there is bring in a stream of auditors to audit those bureaus so that we can find out what's fair and what's not fair and what uh, processes are not even effective enough to continue to fund because there's a lot that we can be doing with the resources we have there to accommodate the needs of our community. People in this, in this city, in this city of Portland, should not be living in poverty. And especially not people who have already systemically been failed. We didn't fail, we didn't create the crime statistics that they used against us to incarcerate us. And now we have that evidence on the record. So we have to reparate. Um, right now in real time, I started a legal clinic because I was like, okay, I'm running for mayor. What can I do to advocate for people besides protests? Okay, I can provide advocacy and legal services so they can get these issues into the courtrooms. So yeah. if they go through the courtroom, they can get a precedent so we can all have access. Uh, Teresa, I saw you had a, um, something <clears throat> that I had to miss because there was a schedule conflict, but it looked really practical. Um, a lot. We got it's it was a clinic for teaching us how to expunge. Yeah, we bring expunges. Yeah. We, we we did it with cannabis dollars. Yeah, that's that's beautiful. That's good work. Yeah, that's good work. Yeah, hundred thousand dollars in cannabis dollars can uh, expunge a whole bunch of people. But the people in that industry are like, our money can go to more than just expungements. It can go to housing. It can go to jobs. It can go to investments in education. It can go to investments in streets and, you know, jobs, building new industry. When we talk about how that industry harmed our community and how people are right now profiting from it, the fact that that tax money that's coming in and the state is utilizing it um, mostly for law enforcement and more surveillance, the, the fact that the people that run the industry want that money to be redirected to communities for reparations, man, you gotta have people on the front line that understand what that looks like to all of our communities and how we can orchestrate dividing that out into the communities and building it because they're not gonna go out of business. Right now, that's an essential service that is still making money. And that industry is saying, we don't want our tax money going to the police. Why can't we get it into your community so that y'all can have more businesses and opportunities so that people don't feel guilty about what we know we're benefiting from, which is the oppression of black people. Come on. I'm sorry, but yeah, we're already on it. I mean, most of the people that we're working with in that industry are not only scientists, but they're people that own their own businesses, they're lobbyists, um, lawyers, and they're intentional about their relationship with me and this campaign and what we want to do here in the city of Portland, because we see the lies. We all, even in legalizing it, we thought that it was going to be a reparation towards economic justice, and it's not. And it's enough to be something for us. I can dig it. Yes, we can get it. We got, check this out. Did you know that election day lands on, on Malcolm X's birthday? No, I didn't. Yeah, May 19th, bro. Well, let me just say, uh, <laughs> I'm like, it's, this is some revolutionary times. For sure. And, you know, the to be transparent, you know, it's like, I know you as somebody that I have uh, been around over the years and gotten to know you through deep conversations, through sharing space with you. And like, I trust, you know, who you are. Transparent. What you see is what you get. You're a real person to me. I don't really, I don't really get involved in electoral politics, you know, yeah. because to me it's about self determination. But that said, the few uh, politicians that I've supported that are running a race to be elected in the campaign um, are the politicians that I know. If some, if something was messed up, I could actually hold them accountable. Yeah. I could, I could go sit down, look you in the face and have a conversation and you would tell me something real and we would- I would show you what's happening. 
I, we, I, I, will walk, I will walk away with a with a deeper understanding what what your role is, and that's the problem. Like that's what gets my vote. Yeah, you see me like because I know you're out here with us, and if yeah. I have a problem, we're gonna talk about it. Yeah, you know all these other fools are not. They're not approachable. They're not accountable. They're not accessible. And they're just professional slick talkers. You know what I mean? Not. And when I say all these other fools, I'm not talking about some of the other candidates. I'm not talking about that. I'm you talking about people who have historically been holding positions of power mm -hmm. in the state. They're sales, they're salespeople. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm just happy that, I mean, whenever I've called upon you, like when I needed you to come out and direct the political uh, engagement that I wanted to serve our community, I wanted them to understand education i mean you remember it was seven platform issues and we had like the the top people in our communities come out for two days but i don't think that i could have pulled people together without you you know what i'm saying and for me that was some intergenerational stuff because there were conflicts within me um just doing the whole situation you know what i'm saying because i felt like on one hand i'm gonna help support gatekeepers by providing a platform to them because we need to understand the science of who they are and what they stand for, especially if they look like us, you know, and you remember those panels was all people of color in all those different spectrums of society um, that have influence over political power and outcomes for our community. And so for me, just having you there um, as somebody that is a strong, you know, representative of our community, that, that made me, that's something I'll honor for the rest of my life. And I remember you said something like, man, how long, I mean, cause we really literally organized that together. And he was like, it usually take people like two years to organize something like this. How, how do you do this? And I was like, cause I'm already connected to everybody. Right, I'm right. already sitting down in everybody living room, eating grits, talking about what they could be doing better and why isn't it happening? And you know, going on to the next house, running around with my backpack. Like mm. I'm not just out here bullying anybody. I'm out here having discussions, doing my research. Um, asking people to be accountable, contacting the DOJ if I got to, you know what I'm saying? Um, co filing complaints, getting lawyers on things. You know, I'm really trying to define an opportunity for us where our community can finally have a position where we get to hold leaders accountable. And once I become a leader, that's, that's usual customary and I demand that type of accountability from myself. I don't want anybody to say, you know, you went in there and changed up, don't let me. You know what I'm saying? I, I don't have time for that. If I go in there and I'm not accessible to you, then I wasted my own time. That means that my whole life is just, you know, like what I'm doing right now is for my nephew and all the kids that we've lost and all the ones that think they don't have a future, period. I want to show them something on the record that really exists in real time. That's what's up. You know? Yeah, I do know. I don't see it. I, I can't find it. I've been li looking for it my whole life. We need it. And I think our generation really got this, you know? Well, we have no we have no choice but to move in the correct direction. Yeah. Uh, despite all challenges. So that's that's what time it is. Um yeah. Well, let me know what else I can do in the future. You know, I yes. it's gonna be interesting to see what what yeah. how things shape <laughs> up with this how long. Uh, this pandemic is going to go on. We see the people in power are really contradicting themselves and stepping on their own words. And there's no clarity. There's no certainty about anything. Uh, and I say that to say, you know, if you think about the consequences of social distancing that that can have on community organizing, we're being forced to to pivot, you know. And yeah, demonstrations and protests were, you know, they were one tactic, you know, but uh we're gonna to have to figure out other ways to connect and to make meaningful things happen. It's an opportunity to be more efficient. Yeah. And because things are clear, it's clear that the people in power, especially in this country, have no idea what they're doing in terms of the interests of the masses. Thank you. You know? So it is our time to step into that space um, and hold the system accountable. Yeah. You know, I, I think the, the, the one of the things I foresee happening, and I'm curious about your thoughts on this, Teresa, is like, if I look into the next five years, I'm seeing, we're seeing the dying of a system, mm -hmm. you know? And so we know that when a system is dying, it's like a bully, 
advice. It right? wants to bully <laughs> its way into staying in power, which is not, this system ain't never been nothing but a bully, right? Yeah. So while we see opportunities, we also have to anticipate greater repression. What do you, how do you see your base, the diversity of your base um, being something that is important as far as like, not just black folks, mm -hmm. but working class folks that don't look like you and me. People who might, some of these people might even uh, voted for Trump you know? against their own interests, right? One of the people that signed my petition to run voted for him. So you you being a public servant though, you're you're gonna represent the interests of the people. Absolutely. Regardless of their ideological hangups. How do you like how do you talk to people about that? Like if you if 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 I if I came up to you and I had a Trump stick, uh, a make America great again hat, <laughs> and I was like, you know, I've been listening to what you say, but why should I support you? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm going to tell you this, one of the people um, that I'm running against, one of the people on their campaign was throwing information out saying, oh, she supported a Republican and da, 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 da. And literally, I worked with Dennis Richardson, who is a former Secretary of State for the, for the state of Oregon. He passed away while he was in office. Um, but before he, he ran for office, even before he ran, he said, look, he said, Ms. Rafer, you're giving people a hard time. And I ran for governor and I can't beat the Democrats. He said, but if you support me, he said, I will give you the information you're seeking because we hear you. We know, like he literally was like, man, nope, ain't nobody thinking you crazy. We know what you're saying. We know what you're asking for. And the fact that we won't give it to you is because we don't feel you're entitled. But once I get elected, I'm going to give you this information because I don't have nothing to lose, right? So the guy gets elected. I don't do anything to promote him. I'm just like, okay, whatever. The dude is, you know, politician, you know, whatever. But he invites me to his inauguration, Mike. The okay. Secretary of State, that's right next to the Attorney General and the Governor, right? right. Invites me to the thing. It's nobody but Trumpers up in there because he's a Republican. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I'm like, dang, they're gonna, you know, I'm thinking I'm a black woman. I don't, I had an afro at the time, you know, like I'm I'm going here. Let me just go in here and let me take my attorney with me. So whatever happened, I got some protection. So I go in there with a, with a lawyer to uh -huh. the inauguration. I'm sitting up here seeing all these big people with, you know, all this hate from people like me. And I see the dude get inaugurated. And in the two years that he served, I seen him give me everything on the record that I was asking without bias. Like, here's everything. What else you need? Education, okay, yep, here you go. Yep, you do got a school to prison pipeline. Yep, it's on the record, here you go. Oh yeah, foster care the kids, oh yeah, boom, here you go. You know, so you see these big giant lawsuits that are happening with all the state is being sued for foster care and the kids is being shipped out of town and we got baby, all that came from somebody that voted for Trump. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that I would ever vote for those, that, that party, connect myself with the party, but I have to be a negotiator in regards to my human rights because they're on the table and everybody's picking off the bodies. You know what I'm saying? Like nobody literally, literally wants that meal to survive. Nobody wants to invest in that, but they're gonna utilize the proprietary access to it. And so getting that information on the on the record from a, a state auditor, somebody that's in charge of every business in the city, every business in the state, every industry, how the government works, that's his job is to oversee all that for them to give us the packages that we've received in the last couple of years, along with all the information we're getting from like the MacArthur Red Foundation, Multnomah County audits, um, city of Portland audits. Um, come on, that's definite evidence. And once we inform the community about what that means in regards to how we assume things were, um, the next plan is to have access to legal access. You know, you have to have a lawyer to do something about it, or you have to have a process that entitles you to some type of repair on that negligence. And it's criminal negligence, it's political negligence, but the biggest part that harms us is not understanding this process, not participating in this process. Um, not having our own voices in the process and leaving it to other people to speak for us in the process. So there ain't a good or a bad, it's just who's going to take away the bag and who's in it? What's in it? If you're not there to claim your soul, you're gone. You know, I don't know how else to put it. It's just, I mean, and it's on the record. I remember when we got the equity audit 
from the, um, you know, the Oregon Education Association, not even the Oregon Education Association, but from the Civil Rights Division on the state education system, the auditors I met with that work for the state, they cried. Mm. They sat up in my Don't Shoot Portland office while we were setting up the press conference and everything. And they were like, when we were doing this, the scope of this information that you tasked us with, with researching is horrible what's happening to these children. Like, it's hard to see what's happening to these children, obviously. And even in their reports to the media, they said, nobody cares about these children, but everybody's getting paid. You know what I'm saying? No accountability, no transparency, no investment. If there was an investment, even if everybody was getting paid, we'd have outcomes we could be proud of. You know, it's a trip because I just think I, I'm always thinking about what you're saying. And you're talking about things happening on a local level, but I'm always I'm talking about statewide. But it, it is. But it's, it's, it's a national issue. It's, it's like the mm-hmm. status quo, the people who have remained in power are being they're just being themselves. Being themselves. They, never, they never gave a damn about anything but staying in power, you know? And so while we're out here running around being divided, arguing with each other on social media about, well, if, if you don't vote for Biden, you're voting for Trump and all this oh, stuff. I'm like, Come on now. These are the same, it's the same class of people, be they Democrat or Republican. It's the same class of people, you guys. So like the local politics, that's where your accountability is. That's and if saying. the local politics don't look like you, then we better figure out how to get somebody involved that looks like us. Okay. That's accountable, you know? Mm-hmm. So that's all. Uh, I, I mean, I feel what you're up to. I support it. And, yes. and don't. For the time. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say, and don't leave it at just having somebody that look at look like you. Um, be a part of that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. If you if you back somebody, stay in they back. You know, let's see what happens May 19th. But on May 19th, call me. Be right. like, Trusta, look, I, I watched the news. Uh which uh which what, what, what your calendar look like? I need to talk to you. I'm I'm free Monday. You still available? All right, what that look like? Because however the outcome is, I'm gonna be all right. You know what I'm saying? But I believe that we're gonna win. You know why? Because I'm a community organizer. And even with COVID-19 holding us back, we got community members like Anna, we got you. You know, we got a big community. When I first announced that I was running, it was over the first 24, 36 hours, we got like 69 people that signed up to volunteer. Mm -hmm. In the time that the campaign has run, we've got over 600 people that signed up to volunteer. Right now, while we're on this call, there are people doing phone banking, there's community members, and these are the same people that we've literally advocated for. These aren't just the people that show up to the protest to take the pictures. These are the people whose lives are on the line, the people whose children are lost, you know, the people who've been struggling through the education system, the health system, looking for housing and everything else. And that's why I'm thankful because they're making me do this. They're like, no. You can do better, you know? Shoot, we're not going to get you in the hospital again. Let's do this smarter, not harder, you yeah. know? And I got a, there's a whole bunch of projects I'm working on that, uh, you know, running the gamut from, from community-owned fiber so that the community controls their own data and information, not the Verizons and the AT&Ts and the Googles and everything else, you know, to, to uh, international hip-hop exchange, like, there's all these different projects. I will sell no wine before it's time, but yes. what I am going to do once you're in office is I'm going to I'm going to approach you and I'm going to say, hey, how can I get some city support? You know, I know some city councilors and commissioners, and then I'm going to know you. Yeah, I'm going to be asking because ultimately the work I'm doing is is like you. I'm a civil servant, right? I'm I'm using no, art, sure. education, hip hop, and activism, but it's not just for me. It's yeah. so that our community can thrive. It's so our consciousness and our awareness can be elevated and so that we can op- operate at our potential. And if I don't see it happen 100% in my lifetime, then I'm going to work all the way up until the wheels fall off so that when I leave, there's a legacy. Yeah. You know? So I'm, I'm happy uh, to be a comrade. That's all. Yeah. And next time, we'll, we'll figure out our... Uh, thank you, Anna, for your support. <laughs> and thank you Andrew for your translation 
and um, thank you, Teresa, for what you're up to. Of course. Yeah, I'm gonna see if I can get in some of this, some of this sun uh, before it's dark, though. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Mike, because you already know, like we look to you for guidance. So, you know, awesome. thank you for educating a community, a, a generation for our community. There's so many kids like, you know, I do the art thing. So I hear your name so much. Do you know my parents? So I'm like, yeah, that's my own boy. Like, <laughs> I got to be cool, you know, so I got to, you know. <laughs> that's cool when they feel when they figure out that we know we all know each other. They, I mean, well, the kids, they looking for connectedness and people that make them feel empowered and inspired. And so when they see somebody that kind of brings that out, uh, they want to make sure that they in good company. So I'm thankful to be in good company, even, you know, with all the stuff that's happening, you know, taking your time from family and, you know, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, y'all have a great weekend. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Mike. Peace. Yay. <laughs>